morning, everybody. My name is Frances Castetta Dice, President of the Houston East End Chamber of Commerce, and it's an honor to welcome you to our COVID-19 business webinar sponsored by Centerpoint Energy. Uh, today is June 23rd, 2020, and we're excited to have uh, three amazing speakers talk about how to be prepared for emergencies and comply with social distancing at the same time. Uh, we are going through COVID-19 uh, crisis right now, but and, and amongst this is also hurricane preparedness. And so we're really honored to have Jeff Linder from the Harris County Flood Control District to speak to us. Also, we have Paul Locke from Centerpoint Energy, who's also one of our board members. And then we also have Commissioner Adrian Garcia, Harris County Precinct 2, to uh, talk to us today. So let's just get started. Uh, Jeff uh, and Paul, thank you very much for being here. Um, for those of you, uh, you are all muted right now. If you have questions, please on the bottom, hover down, ask your questions, and we'll answer those for you. So without further ado, Jeff, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thank you. And uh, thanks for having me. So yeah, we're going to talk about the, the upcoming 2020 hurricane season, um, which began um, about three weeks ago in the Atlantic Basin. And so, uh, let's see if I can get this to advance. There we go. And so this, I always like to start with what we had last year. So this is the 2019 season. And we had a total of 18 named storms. Uh, on average, we have about 12 named storms in the Atlantic Basin. What I mean by named storms is that's a tropical storm. The winds have to get the 40 miles per hour and then it gets that name. So that's what we mean when we talk about named storms. And you can see, a lot of the activity last year was out here in the Atlantic, uh, off the U.S. East Coast and, and, and well out into the Atlantic Basin. Uh, virtually nothing here throughout the Caribbean. And that's been kind of common the last couple of years. It's been very quiet through the Caribbean. And then uh, we did have a few storms in the Gulf. We had Hurricane Barry in July that moved into South Central Louisiana. And then, of course, here locally, last mid-September, we had Tropical Storm Imelda which produced uh, significant amounts of rainfall and flooding uh, in the northeastern, eastern part of Harris County. And then of course, just east of us over in the Beaumont Port Arthur area where they had 44 inches of rain. As a matter of fact, uh, some areas in northeast Harris County had, had worse flooding with Imelda than they had with Harvey uh, back in 2017. And so, you know, that's always one of the big takeaways with these storms is not every storm is the same. Um, not, and every single storm is different and the impacts can be different with each, with each storm. And so it's important to prepare every time for that particular storm. Of course, how hurricanes and tropical storms get their energy is from the, the warm waters. And this is the sea surface temperature anomaly. So this is showing above average and below average uh, water temperatures across the entire uh, world. And so you see the, the orange and reds are above average and the blues are below average. And you can see there for, for much of the Atlantic Basin from Africa through the Caribbean into the Gulf of Mexico, the water temperatures are running above average. And this has been a common theme uh, really since about February. And we, we've seen this above average water temperature signature here across the tropical Atlantic. And that tends to be, this, this type of signature tends to portray an active hurricane season in the Atlantic Basin. The other thing to point out is this strip of blue water or cooler than normal uh, conditions here west of South America to south of Hawaii. Uh, that's below average water temperatures in this region. And really what that is showing is the development of a potential La Nina. So El Nino is very warm water in this region and La Nina is cooler than average water. So you can see we're cooler than average here and uh, it, it appears we may be heading towards a, a La Nina condition as we move into our late summer, early spring. Uh, the other thing to look at, and this is the sea level pressure forecast, so tropical storms and hurricanes are, are lower pressures, and so when the pressures are lower, it's easier for tropical storms and hurricanes to form. And so this is just the average background state uh, sea level pressure across the Atlantic Basin for August, September, October of this year. Everything you see in, in red is uh, pressures running 70 to 100 percent of normal, so it's, it's showing fairly high sea level pressures in the Atlantic. Uh, this, this tends to indicate potentially a little bit of a le less active season. The one thing I will say about this particular model is it tends to over forecast the sea level pressures uh, in the Atlantic Basin a little bit this time of year. And so this may not have as big of a bearing on the season as uh, it looks like there. 
And then the other thing you have to look at is, is, is there going to be moisture available? Tropical storms and hurricanes need thunderstorms to form. And so you look for areas of above average precipitation. And, and we are certainly seeing that here again. This is for August, September, October. Um, here off the northeast coast of South America, and then again in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, this particular model showing above average precipitation anomalies. So this would indicate a fairly active tropical wave train that slides across from Africa into the Caribbean and then into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and that's kind of one of the things we're looking at this year is maybe a little bit less of that development up here in the northern and central Atlantic like we've seen the last few years and more further down here to the south in our more traditional what we call hurricane belt area. Uh, unfortunately, the lower these storms form in latitude, the further west they tend to come, the less likely they are to turn northward into the open Atlantic. And so unfortunately this year it looks like potentially uh, storms coming through the Caribbean and either going into Central America or then turning up towards the U.S. Gulf Coast. And so that's going to be something obviously to pay very close attention to here on the Gulf Coast as we get in August and September. We talked a little bit about that El Nino, La Nina. Again, El Nino is just warm water in the Central Pacific. La Nina is just cooler water. Uh, you can see the forecast here uh, as water temperatures continue to cool and then kind of heading down towards this neutral area between an El Nino and a La Nina, or maybe even La Nina, probably more neutral. Anyways, the point being <clears throat> is uh, these conditions tend to favor Atlantic Basin tropical storm and hurricane development. And so this is another favorable aspect looking forward to this season in the Atlantic Basin for tropical storms and hurricanes. And so when you look at the forecast, everybody likes to hear the numbers. Uh, one thing I'll say about the numbers, they really don't mean a whole lot. We can have an extremely active season like we had last year with 18 named storms uh, and not have any significant big impacts on the U.S. coast. We can have season four or five named storms and have significant impacts. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the quietest seasons we've ever had on record in the Atlantic Basin was 1983. We had four named storms. The first named storm that year was Hurricane Alicia. And so it can be an active year if the storm hits your particular area or our particular area. But anyways, we're looking at 13 to 19 named storms. So this is above active. I think the takeaway here is, is the number of hurricanes we're looking at, six to 10. So half of the tropical storms that form uh, look like they will become hurricanes. That's fairly significant. And then half of the hurricanes that form look to become major hurricanes. And what that is, is that's a category three, four, or five hurricane. So that goes to show you that if the storm is able to form, it looks like it will strengthen and potentially become a really significant hurricane this year. Um, the analog years, and what that is, is these are similar years with similar sea surface patterns, similar El Nino, La Nina, rainfall patterns, all that. You put it together and you see where storms have tracked in these kind of similar uh, years. And then it, 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 in this particular case, the, the exercise was to see if Texas had been impacted. And so there's certainly some years here where we've had nothing in the state of Texas, uh, but there's also some big years that stand out. These are big uh, impacts. 1980 Hurricane Allen was a very intense hurricane that went into northern Mexico. that had a lot of impact down in the Brownsville, Lower Rio Grande Valley area. Of course, most of us will remember Rita from 2005 for the evacuation, uh, turning at the last minute and moving into southwest Louisiana there around uh, Holly Beach. And then, of course, most of us will also remember 2008 uh, with Hurricane Ike. We also had Hurricane Dolly that year that made landfall down on South Padre Island. So these are some pretty big years. Um, interesting what this is also showing, all three of these, Allen, Rita, and Ike, were what we call long track hurricanes. So we knew they were coming for many days. They either came out of the Atlantic or through the Caribbean. So they had long lead up times, that five, six, seven day preparation time period. And that's kind of what the season is, is sort of aiming to look at is, is these longer, track type storms. Of course, that doesn't mean we can't have storm form in the Gulf of Mexico, just like we had Imelda last year, we've had Allison, uh, even Harvey a couple years ago, that form in the Gulf and can strengthen quickly and, and cause lots of problems too. So now's the time to make sure that hurricane plan is ready. Um, you know, 
I'll talk a little bit about how we're doing preparations in COVID, but you know, let me let me hit on the flood insurance real quick. Uh, now's the time to make sure those policies are in place. They take 30 days to go into effect. So if you call your insurance agent now, we're looking at you know mid to late July before you're actually covered. It has to be renewed every year. So just because you had it last year doesn't mean it automatically renews. You need to go in there and make sure you have that coverage. Um, and, and in place, I can't tell you the number of folks I've talked to that had flood insurance. They bought flood insurance after the tax day storm in 2016, and then they let it expire or dropped it before Harvey, and they were not covered for Harvey. And the difference between a flood insurance policy payout for Harvey, which was about $120,000 on average, versus someone who didn't have flood insurance, they only got six to $8,000 um, so flood insurance is, is really a critical thing, especially this year. And it doesn't, y'all know this, it doesn't have to be a hurricane or tropical storm. We're going to have flooding any time of the year around here. And so it's really important uh, that you have those policies and make sure they're, they're there. The other thing I'll touch on is, is this five to seven days of supplies. It used to be the three day supplies. Now we're recommending five to seven days. If, if we have a really big hurricane, uh, you know, a, a Katrina type storm or a Rita type storm or even a Harvey type storm because for us Harvey was a flood. We didn't have a hurricane with Harvey. We had a flood. But down at Rockport and Port Aransas, they obviously had the hurricane part of it. Um, so if we have a storm like that, it's, it's going to take at least a week um, before we're prepared to begin to try to get operations back up and up around here that you can, you're going to have to sustain yourself. Uh, for that period of time. So you need to make sure you have those supplies, build those kits. What I always say about the kit, there's tons of lists out there that remind you what to put in your kit, but you need to build that kit for you, for your specific circumstance, for your specific family. You know, if you have young kids, make sure you have stuff for them. If you have pets, make sure you have stuff for the pets. Um, every kit is kind of your own unique uh, items that you need in those kits, you know, medications, cash, uh, stuff like that. And then lastly, I'll touch on uh, one of the things that we have designed here at the Flood Control District for everybody is this notification system that you can sign up for. So we have our flood warning system, which is our network of gauges that monitor rainfall and, and stream elevations across uh, Harris County and now even the surrounding counties. We have about 250 of these gauges uh, across the area. And you can sign up now by going to this uh, web link there, fwsalerts.org. And you can uh, get rainfall and stream elevation data sent to your phone. So you can pick the gauge you want. You create an account, you pick the gauge you want to receive these alerts from, and it will send, it will send you a text message or an email. And uh, you can also create custom alerts. So if, if you want to know when uh, the bayou is half full or the Sanderson River at, uh, at Banana Bend is half full, you can, you can, create those alerts yourself. And so this is one of the big things we kind of heard after Harvey from folks is I didn't know what website to go to. I just want it delivered to my phone. And this is a way you can go and have that done. And again, this works not just for hurricanes, and tropical storms, but any kind, even yesterday afternoon when we had heavy rain, well, we were getting notifications from this of, for potential street flooding. So it's a great thing to have in this area. And uh, with that, I'll, uh, I guess if we're going to Paul or, Questions? Yes, yes. And so um, I'm going to download that app right now because, I, like you said, I could have used this yesterday with all of the rain uh, that was happening uh, here and all. Um, and then, uh, Jeff, you are also a meteorologist, of course. And uh, any, I know we were talking earlier about today's weather. Do you want to just let our folks know what, what you predict? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we were, we've been looking at this this morning and it's becoming a little concerning for this afternoon and evening and into tomorrow. Uh, with, with the potential for a uh, slow moving line of heavy rainfall across the area tonight. And I, I always get nervous when we get these east-west bands of heavy rain in the overnight hours. So many of our floods that we've had here have come for these types of setups. And so we're going to be paying a lot of attention to this. Uh, you know, right now, I, I think we'll be able to handle it, but it's something that folks need to be aware of. They need to be paying attention to for tonight. Because we could certainly see some some extremely heavy rainfall tonight, uh, two, three, four inches, even in an hour. And you know that's the problem we get into here. If we see that for a couple of hours, we go from pretty much like we are right now 
straight into flooding and it happens very, very fast here. Um, and so people need to be aware of that. I think a lot of it is street flooding, but there would be, if, if we get six, seven inches of rain, there'll be some significant rises on the, on the creeks and bayous. So now's the time to, to look at that uh, notification system uh, and certainly our flood warning system on, on that website where you can go and look at all kinds of data, inundation mapping and stuff like that. Great. Well, we're going to bring uh, Paul and uh, Commissioner Garcia back up just to, to say hello, and then we're going to have his presentation. But Jeff, thank you so much for this information. I know we're going to have all four of us back at the end so we can uh, ask group questions. Uh, this is very insightful, so thank you for that. Commissioner Garcia, we wanted to welcome you to, to uh, our Feel Good Friday uh, session, and uh, honored to have you with us. Well, uh, to be with the East End Chamber always makes me feel good, so Francis, Thank you so very much for uh, having me here. Uh, but having Jeff and uh, his leadership and uh, his insight to all things Mother Nature uh, is always important and it's good to hear uh, his, uh, his take on, on things. But uh, thank you, Francis. I, I really appreciate you. And thank you for all you're doing for area businesses out in the East End community, working with our office to ensure that our small business program uh, small business loan program got out to as many people as possible. So again, thank you. And uh, also got to give a shout out to that other half of yours. Uh, he makes no qualms of letting us know that you are the better half, but he's not too bad himself. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Paul, today's program wouldn't be possible without you. So we wanted to thank you. And then you, we have a slide that we want to go over um, and we'll show that on, on uh, in a couple of seconds. But uh, thanks for, for, for putting this together, Paul. Well, thank you, Francis and the Chamber for uh, putting this uh, conversation together because it's so important. Um, one, to get the word out about the upcoming hurricane season and how uh, active it appears, the forecast <clears throat> appears to be a very active one. And uh, I just think it's important that everyone uh, know the importance of having a plan. And I appreciate uh, Jeff and Commissioner Garcia participating today. Um, I know they're busy, but uh, both bring a lot of valuable information to this conversation. So thank you both for taking time to uh, join this meeting. And before I start, uh, happy birthday, Francis. Uh, thanks for coming out on your birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to uh, hear us talk. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It's my honor. Uh, 21. Yay. Again, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, anyway, I'll get started. <laughs> so, um, well, anyway, I'll get started. So, as uh, as we enter the uh, hurricane season, we find ourselves in uh, unprecedented, unprecedented challenges of the uh, COVID virus and uh, a very, very active hurricane season forecast. Um, I think it's so important that we educate our communities and our residents on the importance of uh, being prepared and, and having a plan. One thing I wanted to share with this group <clears throat> is that Center Point prepares year round for major weather related events. Um, we don't wait uh, till the summer to start planning. We're working uh, year round to get ready um, and know that if a, a major weather related event were to hit the Houston region, every Center Point employee in the Houston region takes on a different role in an effort to get the power back on as quickly as possible. Uh, our crews work uh, seven days a week, 16 hours a day, and um, no one utility can rely upon uh, its own crews to restore power to uh, millions of customers. That's why we uh, have mutual assistance groups that we work with uh, throughout the country. Uh, it's a, a coordination with other utilities <clears throat> so that in the event we have a major weather related event there on call and on standby to come help us. And in the event uh, uh, a hurricane were to hit Florida or another part of the country, we in turn would send our crews to help uh, our friends uh, in other regions of the country to help them get their power back on to their customers as quickly as possible. Um, 
staging sites are also set in advance. One example would be the Sam Houston racetrack. Uh, when these crews come in town and they bring their bucket trucks and their equipment to trim trees, they take up a lot of space. And so we got to make sure we've got a place to uh, locate these folks. And the Sam Houston racetrack is one of several uh, locations around the region that we use to uh, uh, house these folks while they're uh, in town. Contracts are set up in advance uh, that determines labor and, and mileage and, and uh, rates that we will pay our vendors so that uh, we're not held up negotiating uh, rates. It's just a phone call away. People know that when they leave their respective um, uh, service center, wherever they work, that they're on the clock and, and they know uh, that they're going to get paid. Um, as Jeff said, no two storms are alike. And, and one thing we learned, um, we learned that for sure after Ike, Ike was definitely a um, wind related event, whereas Harvey was uh, a, a water related event. Um, we, we definitely lost more customers after Ike than we did Harvey. Uh, Ike, uh, we lost well over 90% of our customers. Uh, we had a lot of distribution poles that went down because of wind. Whereas Harvey, um, it was more of a water related event and it was uh, the challenge there was just getting access to some of our uh, uh, substations that were flooded and so we had to wait for uh, the flooding to go down but in the Ike related event we had crews from all over the country and Canada to come in and assist us with getting the power back on uh, as quickly as possible um, but it did take us about three weeks <clears throat> to um, restore power to over two million customers that's why we wanted to get together today and just stress that residents have a plan and depending on the severity of the storm uh, will depend on how long it takes us to restore power. And not all storm, like I said, not all storms are created equal. You may remember the uh, uh, weather related event we had, I believe Wednesday evening, the Wednesday evening after Memorial Day weekend uh, we had high, uh, a storm that blew through the region very, very quickly. Uh, high, uh, high winds and um, was in and out of the region within hours, but we lost 375,000 customers. And it wasn't even a, a major uh, hurricane. So it's just, <clears throat> we're asking people to be prepared and um, have a plan and uh, especially if you have a loved one that has special uh, medical needs, it's imperative that you plan now, uh, whether you're evacuating or whether you're planning to ride it out, can't stress uh, enough the importance of having a plan. When, our, when a hurricane does hit or a major weather related event does hit, we realize that everybody work, wants their power back on first or as quickly as possible and know that we first work to get our priority circuits back on, and those would be like um, water facilities, uh, police stations, fire stations, uh, any, any critical structure that's going to serve the needs of the region, communication hubs, anything that's gonna serve the region and help the region get back to normal as quickly as possible. Those are typically the hubs that are the circuits we get back on first. Um, <clears throat> outages that are impacted by uh, trees and limbs. Um, if, if you're on a, uh, our, our, our biggest priority is once we get the priority circuits back on is getting power back on to as many people as possible um, so that we can help <clears throat> get every, the region going back to normal as soon as possible. If you're on a circuit, for example, that only has five or 10 customers out, chances are you're gonna be one of the, I mean, it's gonna take a while for us to get power back on to you. 
and especially if there are trees or debris that are blocking our crews into getting uh, access uh, to your outage, that's going to delay the outage. But we do know that <clears throat> after um, Harvey or during Harvey, we did start using uh, drones to help us access our equipment to tell us what type of uh, damage our equipment had incurred. And that came in very handy with the flood. Uh, we had a, a substation in the um, memorial area that flooded and with the use of drones, we were able to tell how deep it was and what we were gonna need to do to get that uh, station uh, restored quicker than normal. Um, Communication is obviously very, very important. Um, we encourage people to sign up for our power alert service. I don't know if you can see it on that slide, but mm -hmm. uh, it's on our website. It's called the power alert service for information on individual outages. You can uh, receive uh, updates via text, email, or uh, voicemail, phone call. Um, and it's a great service. Uh, day in and day out to keep you updated on where things stand with your outage. You can also follow us on Twitter at CMP Alerts. Um, that's a very handy uh, information, that's a very handy source of information during major storms on what we're doing and the things we're working on. And then finally, um, we have an outage tracker that's on our website that shows where the outages are across our service system on the electric side, uh, shows how many people we have out and where those outages are located. <clears throat> we also on our website have natural gas and electric safety tips. They're available in English and Spanish uh, for folks to use. We do encourage people to call our call center if they notice a gas leak or if they see a live electric line that is down. But we do not encourage people to call us to notify us that their power is out because due to the smart meter, we know their power is out. We know there's no need to call us. But we do encourage you to call us. Uh, it just helps keep the uh, lines open uh, and but we do encourage you to call us for emergency or, or safety related issues. That's, um, that's good to know. Yeah. So, but I think I've said a lot. Um, I want to. Uh, I'll leave it at that, and uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Commissioner Garcia. Yes, and so again, this couldn't happen by, by with one department alone, and it takes a partnership and a collaboration, and that's why we're grateful to have three of you from different or different departments together. Uh, Commissioner Garcia, can you add on to to being prepared during during hurricane season, especially during a COVID situation? Well, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, in Harris County, Texas, um, if you are just getting the news that you need to be prepared for a hurricane season. Uh, you may have been li living under a rock. Uh, Mother Nature likes us around here. And so your uh, hurricane preparedness should just be really a year round thing. Harris County's flat. So even with the strongest of rains or typical thunderstorms that may come through, outside of the hurricane season could create hurricane like flood conditions. And so we we're always prepared. Uh, but you know, I'll tell you that as a precinct office, uh, it's it's uh, wonderful to be on this on this program with you, uh, Francis, because a lot of people don't often hear much about county government, uh, but it is our trucks, it's our cherry pickers, it's our um, our crews that go out there and begin the recovery process as quickly as possible. We're the ones uh, cleaning out, uh, clearing out the roadways. If trees have fallen, if branches have fallen, uh, we work in tandem with a lot of uh, the other agencies. Uh, you know, when Jeff has given us information, we're pushing that out through our own pages to our constituencies, uh, and so it's all a it's all a great team effort. And I'll tell you that. Uh, uh, but I also am proud to live in Harris County. You know, I I was on City Council after uh, Tropical Storm Allison. 
and uh, but I was with the Houston Police Department at, at the time. And then on council, I went through Hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and Ike, and uh, and then lived through like everybody else, uh, Harvey. And so we, uh, you know, I'm proud to live in Harris County from the standpoint that whenever natural disaster uh, knocks on our door, we as a community come together and we answer the door. Uh, during, uh, uh, you know, Katrina and Rita, you know, we welcomed thousands from New Orleans uh, and figured out how to uh, embrace an entire city. And then during uh, Ike, uh, I saw so many power lines or <clears throat> extension cords going from one home to the neighbors. Everybody sharing it, uh, sharing uh, the resources, being in it together. Uh, and so these are all part of the processes that we do as a, as a precinct office in terms of uh, communicating with folks, encouraging them to be prepared. But we're also doing some fundamental things. For example, uh, who would have thought that ditch digging uh, would be considered something so essential and critical to flood defense? But uh, in my estimation that if we do not have an effective local drainage system, then the water uh, stays in our neighborhoods. And during Hurricane Harvey, a lot of neighborhoods flooded, not because the floodways uh, overran, but because the water that came into the neighborhoods didn't have anywhere to go due to a uh, unmaintained uh, uh, drainage system. So the precinct office, for example, has never done uh, more than 200, maybe 300,000 linear feet a year. Uh, but last year, in my first year, I was excited that we got to 400,000 feet. This year, we are on track, Francis, to do over a million linear feet of uh, ditch maintenance, digging out those ditches, making sure that those culverts are working, and then making sure that we're connecting to the outfalls so that that water can get out of the neighborhoods as quickly as possible. And very obviously, important. Yeah, very important. And obviously because we're such a flat territory, uh, you know, that brings its own challenges. But as a county commissioner, I'm, very, I'm working very closely with the Harris County Flood Control District, our engineering office, and the innovative engineers in our community who are bringing, um, you know, uh, great ideas like those underground tunnel systems. I mean, those things are still out in front of us, but we have to welcome that innovation so that we can make sure that Harris County remains relevant uh, in our uh, global and uh, national and state and local economy. Uh, we can't have people saying, ah, oh, Harris County, I would take my business there, but they flood a lot. That's not the conversation we want. So we're doing all those things uh, to, to be prepared. And then as you touched on the pandemic. Um, you know, I, Francis, when I came into office, I was thinking about the environment. I was thinking about public safety. I was thinking about flooding. I was thinking about mobility. I was thinking about public health. And uh, I didn't get the memo that we should be thinking about a pandemic. Uh, but I'm so proud of how uh, we again have answered the call and we're doing our very best. You know, initially, uh, Harris County was a outlier from the rest of the state in terms of the rate of infection, uh, the number of deaths, <clears throat> and, uh, and that we were holding the line on, uh, on the, on the uh, peak. But uh, due to a lot of circumstances, uh, we are facing uh, some serious challenges in the very, very near future. I met with the CEO of the Harris Health System, and um, you know the prediction is by early July, uh, we will be at an all-time peak, uh, or we'll be hitting a major peak, and it's unsustainable for our uh, healthcare system. So we all need to be in it. I know that you know wearing these uh, these masks is not comfortable. It's not uh, it's not you know what we have to match with our clothes, uh, but it is uh, what we need to be doing to ensure that we're keeping everybody safe uh, and, and keeping people out of the hospital systems, out of those, uh, those uh, uh, 
uh, ventilators, off those ventilators. Uh, and so I simply asked folks, look, he, he the advice, not for me, but he the advice from our healthcare professionals. They're scientists. Uh, they are people who know uh, and who we go to when we got a headache or we're not feeling well, we go to them. And when they tell us do this or do that, we generally take their advice more often than not. Today should be no different when we're talking about this pandemic. They're saying wear face coverings, wash your hands, sanitize regularly. These are things that we need to be doing to keep ourselves, our loved ones, our neighbors, our coworkers out of harm's way as well. And so when you combine a flood event with a pandemic, Francis, there's no simple answer for it, but we are preparing for it. Uh, we are preparing for the, uh, the, 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 the possibility that we need to uh, rescue people in a flood event during a pandemic. Uh, we are now better prepared with, with PPE equipment than we were at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, our staff is more in tune with all of the precautions necessary uh, to do the social distancing during a rescue event will be a real thought process and a, a real part of the strategy. So we are uh, folding everything over that we've learned during this pandemic for the event that Mother Nature will challenge us, uh, but yet again. Great, good, great. Uh, thank you for, for saying those words. And we're very honored to have you as a leader during uh, this pandemic. Um, but we're gonna bring the other two uh, gentlemen back on for, for group questions. Um, um, and, and first of all, one of the questions that was asked is, when, uh, how long does hurricane season last? And Jeff, I know you answered that, but for those of you who didn't uh, get that answer, uh, you, would you like to answer that again? Yeah, so hurricane season starts June 1 and it goes through November 30th. Uh, here in Texas, we're a little bit fortunate that our season's kind of compressed. So we can start right out the gate in June. Uh, of course, Allison was the first week of June. And uh, typically by mid-October, we're finished here. It's very rare for us to have storms late October, November. Uh, our, our peak time is August and September. So people are asking, do I need to get ready? Yes, now is the time to get ready. Our biggest uh, type, you know, our big strong types of hurricanes, your Harveys, your Ikes, your Ritas, those tend to be in August and September. But I will say we, we have to be ready in June and July because we do get hurricanes here. We've had uh, a category four hurricane here uh, in June. Uh, back in 1957, Hurricane Audrey made landfall near Sabine Pass as a category four the third week of June. So we have to be ready this time of year and the, and the time to prepare. If, if the, if the common theme across all of us today is you have to be prepared and you have to be ready. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And Commissioner Garcia, I know that the, the phrase turn around, don't, gra don't drown is very uh, important during this time period. Um, um, how does that impact you? And do you know if there's an app for your district that people can, can follow for places to avoid? Well, we work um, uh, through the readyharris.org uh, system. So please, we, we're trying not to give you 100 apps to try to track different things. Mm -hmm. Ready Harris is the best possible place to get uh, instantaneous and up-to-date and accurate information. It's coming from trusted sources, from Jeff, from our Office of Emergency Management, from the judge. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we are as uh, coordinated and, uh, and synced as uh, much as possible. Uh, so we, we do not use anything other than the Ready Harris uh, website to uh, put the information out. We generally take information from that side and then push it out. But Ready Harris is the singular place that I would encourage everybody to be familiar with. Um, and then also, I want to make sure that uh, folks know that um, the, you know, we go through a lot of uh, uh, work here as an office, given that I've got uh, all of East Harris County, I've got Port of Houston, I've got uh, Pasadena, Galena Park, Deer Park, Jacinto City, La Porte, Baytown, Webster, Clear Lake, uh, South Houston, Aldine, uh, Atascocita, uh, Crosby and Huffman. Highlands, Channel View, Cro Cro uh, Cloverleaf. Uh, these are all vulnerable areas that uh, get challenged whenever we do have uh, uh, flooding conditions. And uh, so we do tabletop exercises. We do preparedness. 
Uh, we do coordinate with our mayors uh, to make sure that we are uh, a team. You know, I, you know, when I hear a flood event in Pasadena or in Laporte or in Seabrook, I'm calling those mayors up and saying, tell me what you need, how can we be helpful? And they'll give me an up-to-date information of their uh, on the ground conditions. And then we'll talk uh, whether uh, anything else needs to happen. But it's a team effort and I can't thank uh, Center Point enough uh, that in spite of neighbors helping neighbors during uh, uh, Hurricane Ike, I would be on a lot of those uh, calls and listening to their efforts to get our, our grid uh, back up and running. And, uh, and so it's, it's all, I, it's incredible to witness the, the response uh, process and the recovery process. It's just a magnificent uh, theater to watch because everybody is working off of one sheet of music and that's to help our, our community. Thank you, and, and that leads to a question for, for Paul. <laughs> Um, I personally um, have a, a transistor radio that, that uh, just in case the power goes out and this is used by batteries. And the thing is, we, we looked for it today and it took us three hours because we didn't remember where we put it. So it is important to be prepared. Uh, Paul, are there any other things like uh, a transistor radio that, that a, a family should have uh, that, that you may not, not remember that, that you have in your house that you have to go look for? Well, I think uh, flashlights are always helpful. Um, <clears throat> the battery powered uh, radio like you've got, uh, non-perishable food, water. Um, uh, you know, one thing we learned uh, a long time ago was to uh, fill up your bathtub with water um, uh, in case the water, the power shuts off, it's a, a good source uh, to keep uh, uh, things moving, if you know what I mean. But uh, I would say water, perishable food, and plenty of uh, flashlights and uh, candles, definitely for sure. Good. And this is a question for all of you guys. So uh, post Harvey, uh, the chamber created some, a video series about business preparedness, which we'll, we'll be having uh, links after this on our website. So what are your tips for businesses on how to prepare for a disaster uh, and post disaster? We'll start with you, Jeff, if that's okay. You know, the, the biggest thing I think for businesses is continuity of operation plan. And that's a big word for having a plan of what you're going to do if your business, your physical business location is damaged and you can't go back in there after the storm happens. And, and honestly, most of us have, have done a, a continuity of operations plan during this pandemic because we've been forced to. We, we haven't been able to operate like we normally operate. And so it's very important to have that plan in place to know where your employees are going to be to stand up. Uh, operations outside of the impact area. So if you, if you need to move your your headquarters from Houston to Dallas or Austin so you can run efficiently up there. And then one of the other important things with all that is backing up any sort of records that you may need. That, that's really important. And then communicating with your employees and how you, you have to have multiple ways to communicate. Everyone's not going to necessarily have a cell phone or have cell phone service or have a, a cell phone. So do you have mass notification systems? Not everybody is gonna be able to connect to email. And so have at least two or three different ways that you can communicate with all your employees. Good, and Commissioner Garcia, uh, would you, can you add to that? You know, I, I, I'll just simply say that um, know you're in Harris County, uh, you know your neighborhood, you know where your business is at. Uh, you know whether you're likely to get high water if it sprinkles uh, or somebody leaves the hose on. So you know your conditions. And so be sure to be thoughtful about this. And then think about your employees as well. Uh, think about uh, what uh, the fact that some of them may not live in the neighborhood and may have difficulty getting to you. So think about those, uh, those issues. Uh, the continuity of operations is essential for any uh, business of any size to think about. And then also, um, you know, we learned during uh, Hurricane Rita that when you tell people to evacuate, they do. Uh, but uh, we also realized that uh, when people evacuated could also be those businesses that we didn't realize at the time are essential. Our gas stations, 
are uh, convenience stores uh, where people need to get food and water. Uh, so recognize uh, your significance in the process. Think about uh, what your role may be and what you need to do to, do to prepare uh, for the recovery process because the best thing for any neighborhood in, in, in our community is to get it open as quickly as possible as soon as the hurricane passes. Great, thank you. And, and Paul, I know that you, when businesses are, are shut down, uh, you are out there trying to turn it on as soon as possible. Any other uh, tips that businesses could do? <clears throat> no, um, I just, I think the communication part is very, very important. And, um, you know, I would uh, encourage uh, businesses to consider natural gas generators as a backup plan. Um, because again, you know, no two storms are alike, and <clears throat> you could have a storm um, that um, where flooding is involved. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll reference Ike. You know, during Ike, we lost everybody but downtown Houston and the Med Center, and that's because they were underground. Um, and then during Allison we lost the med center because it was, it flooded and it was underground. So you've just got, <clears throat> you've just got to be prepared and you've got to be prepared for extended outages. And I would highly encourage folks to consider the use of, uh, or, or look at getting a, a backup generator just to help keep their uh, businesses uh, open and operating. Right, generators are, are key. Um, and um, what I wanted to also ask this, this, this last question to everybody. So how are you personally being uh, managing with your home life and the new work environment during COVID-19 and getting ready for, for hurricane, uh, working from home, et cetera? Jeff, we'll start with you. Well, the good news for me is uh, myself and my group, we tend to operate remotely a lot anyway. So we're out in the field or I'm operating from Transstar <laughs> or stuff like that. And so it, it wasn't a significant challenge um, for me. I will say, uh, I, I, I hope that some of the stuff that, that we've learned during all this, we continue moving forward, like meetings like this. I mean, this is, this is these are great meetings and you don't have to spend two or three hours driving halfway across Houston to go to a meeting for 20 minutes. And so I, I hope when all this is over, some of the stuff that uh, we've implemented during this, that I think a lot of us kind of went a little bit kicking and screaming into, um, and it's worked out fairly well. I hope we keep it. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Garcia. Likewise, I'll just, uh, you know, our office, we tend to be um, in the field, we are, we often run into Jeff at the Transstar. Uh, we have our own uh, emergency operations center uh, in at the Washburn uh, Tunnel facility. Uh, we have our call center. So we're uh, anywhere from the places that you would see Judge uh, Hidalgo giving us uh, the updates as uh, things are transpiring or being out in the field where our crews are working on those last minute uh, details uh, that we're hearing in the community. So uh, we're very, very fluid, very flexible as the, as the needs arise. Uh, but generally speaking, we're very close to uh, the Office of Emergency Management because we need to make sure that we're tracking uh, all the details and then conveying that information to our troops out on the, on the ground and coordinating those resources. Great. And then Paul, are you enjoying working from home? Uh, you know, I didn't like it at first, but I've gotten used to it. And I, I got to tell you, I don't I miss driving in uh, traffic, rush hour traffic every day. <laughs> I, I but, hear you. I hear you. Oh, well, goodness. But, well. but I would say just real quick, I did, I did buy flood insurance and uh, it kicked in on the 21st. And I did, our, our family put our money where our mouth is and we did buy a natural gas generator for our home. And so, um, and otherwise attending a lot of Zoom meetings um, and virtual meetings, just like everybody else. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you gentlemen so much for joining us. Uh, before we close, is there any last messages that we haven't uh, uh, stated that you would like to, to add? We'll start with you, Jeff. 
You know, I just I just want to make sure people understand. Like like I said, every storm is different. So the the recollection from everybody here is going to be Harvey. And the, I, I promise you, the next storm that comes our way is not going to be Harvey. And so you have to prepare for that storm and the impacts of that particular storm. Um, you know, we've dealt with wind uh, with Ike, and we dealt with flooding with Harvey and Imelda. But there's also that aspect of storm surge down along the coast that can be so devastating uh, for our coastal communities, Southeast Harris County, Galveston, Bolivar. And uh, it's imperative that those folks down there understand their risk. And when they're told to evacuate, that you leave. Um, but it's also very important for people to understand just because you flooded in Harvey does not mean you're going to flood the next storm. And it also does not mean you need to evacuate. Uh, evacuation is for coastal areas, and it's important that those coastal folks be allowed to evacuate out of this region. Um, and so just keep that in mind and, and pay attention to what the forecast is and the impacts is for, for that particular storm, and be careful about drawing conclusions from what you've been through with other storms. Thank you. Commissioner Garcia? And uh, similarly, it's look, um, you, if you've just moved to Harris County, this is news for you. Uh, but for, for those of us who have had uh, uh, we have made Harris County our home for for years. We know what we're up against, and so just recognize it. Be prepared. Think about uh, the circumstances that you have, the loved ones. If you've got uh, vulnerable folks that you're that are living with you or that you have to uh, provide care for, your emergency plan for those circumstances is critical to success at the moment that we need to activate in some regard. And, uh, but also stay informed, heed the warnings. That's the most critical thing. Kind of going back to the pandemic, use the face mask. But when you hear Jeff and other meteorologists talking, when you hear the judge conveying a particular direction, heed it uh, because uh, we're not just making this up just to uh, have fun with folks. It's, it is very thoughtful, scientific, strategic information that we're putting out uh, and so we need your support uh, to uh, roll those plans out in the best possible way so that everything goes as smooth as possible. That is the best thing uh, in these circumstances. Uh, don't look out the window and say, well, I don't see anything. This, it's sunny. It's nice uh, blue sky. Those guys are out of their mind. They don't know what they're talking about. They know what they're talking about. So just plead, respect the scientists and uh, and heed the warnings. Thank you so much for that. Paul, uh, and again, thank you and Centerpoint for putting this together. Any closing words? It was uh, our pleasure, Francis, and I would just uh, I think <clears throat> echo. Paul, now you can start. Um, it was our pleasure to uh, sponsor today's meeting and I would just echo what's already been said. No two storms are alike. Um, every storm is different and it is imperative you have a plan for your family as to what you're, you're gonna do, whether you're gonna stay or you're gonna evacuate. And it's uh, not too early to start getting your supplies in place now for the next weather related event. So Great. have a plan. I agree and I'm gonna create my plan today and, and execute it. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, again, we're gonna have this on our website for those of you who wanna share this with other folks because there's very important tips. Um, and please make sure that you visit our East End Strong Facebook group page to support the businesses in our area and to let us know who, what businesses we can help support out there. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you all uh, next Tuesday. Remember to prepare, educate, restore, and communicate. Thank you all. Have a great day. Happy birthday again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.